Uh, good to be with you. Uh, nice to see your stool. I've been impressed. It's a nice looking facility. I got to see some of the science stuff as well. You're going to have to get used to this thing. It didn't wire me the first hour, and this is. Ooh. Anyway, um, so I hope you got out of something good to be here. <laughs> so, uh, we're all chemistry folks, right? Think chemistry? Yeah. And I understand that you've been through a nuclear science, uh, nuclear chemistry section right now, so all this might make some sense. Hopefully, I was we were saying in the first hour, you know, that you start talking about a new discipline and it's, it's the vocabulary that other people use in other disciplines. I think that's the hardest part of learning a new discipline. And if you don't know the terms, it just really is tough. I, I talk to bio, um, biological scientists, chemists all the time. Fascinating work. I don't understand anything they're talking about. Every time they say a sentence, they've got about three words I understood. Um, so, so if you've had some nuclear background, uh, I, I asked the first IR, let's try it again. So the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word nuclear? Boom, explosions, yeah. Anything else comes to mind when you say the word nuclear? I'm sorry, up to radiation, all right. Yeah, not necessarily good either, but could be. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about today about reactors, two different kinds to kind of contrast and compare. Research reactors and the power reactors, and some of the things we do with them, why they're important to us. So to start out with, um, what is a reactor? A reactor, of course, is a, is a nuclear phenomenon where we are, at least in today's world, uh, splitting atoms and draining them apart and getting from that given energy and because sustaining a chain reaction. But in addition to that, they, they both have these in, that in common, but there are two kinds of reactors in general, those used for research like the University of Missouri Research Reactor, which I'm going to talk about, and those used for power, like our Missouri Callaway Nuclear Power Plant. What's, what's Callaway's purpose in life? What's it do? What's it make? Callaway Nuclear Power Plant, outside of, outside of the middle state. What's it there for? Power generation, and specifically, what kind of power? Electrical, thank you. Yeah, its purpose is to make electricity, isn't it? And is a pro in the process of making electricity, they're running a nuclear power plant, which means they get into radiation and waste and all kinds of stuff they'd rather not deal with. But that's just part of the byproduct of making energy that way. Research reactors, on the other hand, don't make energy for useful purposes. They're not big enough for starters. Look at the comparison up there in terms of um, values and quantities. Um, the research reactor in Missouri is the largest in the United States. But it's only 10 megawatts compared to 3,000 plus for Callaway. So in a research reactor, what we're interested in really is the radiation, or really what it is, it's a neutron source. It makes neutrons. We use those neutrons for lots of different purposes. And we actually throw away our energy. So Callaway's making electricity and sort of, quote, throwing away the radiation part of it. And we're doing just the opposite of a research reactor. <clears throat> this is the basic process. I think you've probably seen this before in nuclear chemistry. You take some heavy atom and nucleus, like a uh, uranium-235 atom. You put a neutron into it, you make it unstable, it literally splits into two pieces. In that process, it gives off energy thanks to Einstein equals mc squared, which is still just crazy, isn't it? Think about it. I mean, what you have is you have some, you have that fissile ice stuff over there, and you weigh it, and it gets so much mass. Then you get the pieces on the right-hand side, the fission products, and you weigh it, and it weighs less. And you can't just make things disappear on you, so where does that mass go? Well, you stick that mass into Einstein's little equation, it comes out being energy. You know, yeah, I just turned a solid object into pure energy. How's that work? It's amazing. Anyway, that's the process. And then when you split that atom apart, new, new neutrons are given off, two or three of them, and those are the neutrons that will split the next one, and of course, that's the chain reaction. So let's talk about the research reactor first of all. There we are in the middle of, uh, well, Columbia. We're still off a campus if you're up there. We're just kind of downhill from the football stadium. It's that blue building in the middle. And that blue building is our containment building. All reactors in the Western world are required to be inside a containment building. So if you have a bad accident, have a bad day, radiation is released inside that building, it stays there. It doesn't get out in the public. And we do require that of all of our research reactors and our power reactors in the Western world. Uh, you've probably heard of Chernobyl, bad accident in Ukraine, and part of the problem with Chernobyl was the fact no containment building, it was in a bunker building. 
And when it went awry and tore itself apart and started burning, it was something like 5% of the total inventory of radiation that straight into the environment because it had no safety building. And we require safety buildings. As I said, research reactor at NU is the largest on the university campus, and this graph shows you how much energy or how many neutrons, so to speak, come out of the research reactor compared to other campus research reactors in, in the United States. And you can see it's a lot compared to everybody else. <laughs> you know, that, that second-rate institution there, MIT, has a reactor as well, and they produce about a third of many, as much power and neutrons as we do at the, at the research reactor here. So it's really a unique facility. It's kind of amazing that something of that capability is existing right here in the middle of our state. Um, and the other reactors that are listed out there, and somewhere out there is, is the research reactor at Rolla, is one of the small ones. Well, I don't think it's listed. I think it's on down the list a little bit. I, uh, but, uh, don't think that's that's good and bad. Um, the research reactor at MU and MIT and a couple of two, three of the top ones there are basically little factories um, in terms of making things on purpose and having a commercial uh, arm and that sort of thing. And the other small ones over there are typically training reactors. So for example, if you want to become a nuclear engineering student and you really want to get your hands on the raw and play with that research reactor, you can literally get to control it in the control room. They'll teach students how to control the reactor. At the NURR, we're in production use more. We have operators, 20 of them, that run our reactor all the time. And we don't really get to put our hands on it specifically to run it. So they kind of have different purposes. They're neither one's good or bad. Ours is more for research and reduction. The smaller ones are more for training. Depends on what you're looking for. Uh, let's build it up. There's a fuel assembly. It's actually about 24 inches tall long. And, you know, cross-section, something like that, probably softball size. Uh, it's made up of plates, which have uranium sandwiched between aluminum uh, cladding, we'll call it, and gaps mm -hmm. down between those curved, 24 curved plates where the water can flow through and take away the heat and energy that happens. So inside those plates, uranium is splitting, neutrons are coming out of those plates, causing more uranium diffusion and so on. Um, the core is on the, I'm jump up there pretty soon for some things, but I don't need to do it all the time. The core, you can see where it says on the right hand uh, mm -hmm. column, it says fuel zone. That's the fuel assemblies are actually in a circle about 13 inches across and 24 inches tall. And uh, that forms the core. Um, we say it's small compared to power reactors, but in terms of when you think about 10 million watts of power coming out of a tank that's that big around by that tall, that's a lot of energy. If we could turn all that energy into electricity, which you can't do, but if you could, if we had energy equivalents, that would light 100,000 100 watt bulbs coming out of a tank that big. That's why nuclear is so concentrated. <coughs> An example of it. So anyway, so this is looking down, straight down on top of the reactor, and the, the pie-shaped elements are these things right here. There are eight of them in a circle. And as you might imagine, the really hot spots right in the middle where most of the neutrons are. And so we can put samples inside this center pipe and let the neutrons from the reaction irradiate those. And we'll talk about what that's for. The reactor is also surrounded by graphite, this ring right here. And all these holes represent sample positions where we can stuff stuff in so as neutrons leak out of the system, they can irradiate samples. We have beam tubes, where neutrons come down just a pipe, kind of like a flashlight beam of neutrons. And the physics community uses that for uh, what they call neutron scattering. They can tell you how far apart two atoms are in a big complex molecule, all sorts of good stuff I don't really understand, but that's the, beam, the uh, neutron scattering uh, part of this reactor. Then we have one pneumatic tube system, which is shown over here, P-tube. It's like when you go to the bank to get your Check cashed, you know, and you put it in a little container and it's sucked off to the teller and comes back, hopefully with money in it. Uh, we do the same thing, except we can radiate samples with that P-tube system. We have little, what we call rabbits, or little polyethylene vials, about so long, inch in diameter, put a sample in there, put it in this machine, it sucks it off and puts it in the reactor for a few minutes to get it radiated and brings it back, so you have to walk in the door every time you want to radiate something. So that's kind of what it looks like. So, uh, the research reactor at NU uh, just gets involved in all kinds of stuff. Um, 
You're probably thinking, oh, I've got a research director on campus, well, that's where the geeky nuclear engineers hang out, and that's probably about it. And some campuses tend to be a little like that. Many reactors, uh, research reactors on university campuses belong to nuclear engineering programs, and they're used primarily for research or for teaching of nuclear engineering students. Ours are a little bit different from the standpoint that it, it belongs to the whole campus, and that's been good from the standpoint of all this interdisciplinary work going on. So there's a bunch of you know, possible uh, people that collaborate with the reactor, and you see things like archaeometry. You know, what are archaeometrists doing with research reactors? Well, it turns out they can use the reactor to do trace element analysis to understand uh, the composition of, say, obsidian arrowheads. So that if they find an arrowhead in Missouri, which they do from time to time, and they can trace it back to where it came from, and some of those come from Central America, so they can understand how societies work with each other. So you get all kinds of different programs involved, and this is just another chart that kind of says the same sort of thing. Obviously, the nuclear engineering science people are down here in the bottom right-hand corner, but you see things like archaeometry and uh, veterinary medicine, radiology, and chemistry, of course. We have the largest, I this is the first hour, we have the largest radiochemistry program, uh, academic program, uh, in the United States at MU. Uh, these are chemistry students. Uh, it's a graduate degree, typically leading to a PhD, but it's in radiochemistry. Uh, there aren't very many of them around in the world, and uh, the one of them is at MU, and it's one of the larger programs. So this is a list of some of the isotopes we produce routinely at the reactor, and these literally go around the world. Um, we, uh, a lot of these isotopes are uh, very short-lived, especially the medical ones. You've learned about half-life, right? Okay. These have half-lives, all the medical ones have half-lives on the order of days to weeks. And so we need to be making them all the time and have to ship them you know, many times by jet aircraft to get them where they need to go. A lot of them, for example, are going to Europe right now for medical studies and that sort of thing. And you have to do it quickly because, again, if you waste your time, you're going to decay away and you don't have anything. So just an example, let me just go down the list and kind of pull some out. We won't have time to talk about them. But the first two, of course, are gold isotopes, 198, 199. Those are used in the nanoparticle uh, cancer therapy work. That's in the research stage. Cobalt-60, about halfway down, is used to, for food irradiation, to sterilize food, to sterilize medical instruments that go into surgical suites, that sort of thing. The TC-177, next to the bottom, is uh, one of the isotopes, again, that's going to Europe right now for clinical trials on treating pancreatic cancer. Uh, pancreatic cancer is a, uh, got like a 5% survival rate. They're treating patients in Europe right now with this new drug that's based on the teaching 177, which we're providing part of it. We don't know how people long, what the life expectancy of these people are because none of them died yet. That's how effective it is. Really exciting because pancreatic cancer is just the death knell. And we may be carrying it with this stuff. Uh, second column, molybdenum 99 decays to technetium 99M metastable. That's used 30,000 times a day in hospitals in the U.S. to take pictures inside the body. To give you a little bit of activity in your bloodstream, the biochemistry takes that to the organ of interest. Maybe we want to look at your liver. Maybe we want you to look at your brain. Uh, maybe we want to target that so we go to cancer cells so we can see what cancer is. We take a picture of where that radiation is inside your body and get an image back. Um, technetium 99 and uh, Molly 99 is used for that. Uh, P32 and P33 in the middle of that second column are used in the life sciences, uh, excuse me, no, in uh, uh, biological systems, life sciences, uh, I should say plant pathology, that sort of thing. Um, any university worth its salt doing research in, in biology is doing research with P32 and P33. For example, we can lace some fertilizer with a little bit of radioactive phosphorus and then we can watch it move through the plant and understand how the plant takes up nutrition and, and that sort of thing. Uh, it all comes, all of North America, P32 and P33 for that kind of research comes from the research right here. Uh, what are we missing here? Uh, Samarium-153 I'll talk about in a minute for uh, bone cancer. Yttrium-90 is for uh, liver cancer treatment. One more I think I missed, but I think it's an idea. Those are the kind of isotopes we produce and uh, some of the things they're used for. 
So I want to pick one real quickly. If you take your periodic table and you look at the elements that you can put in a reactor and make them radioactive for some medical useful purpose, those are the ones in the blue boxes. So you see there's quite a few of them up there that can be turned into a radioactive isotope equivalent that can be used usefully in medicine. And I've highlighted just a couple for the research reactor. Uh, the reactor has developed three drugs which are now in clinical use based on radioisotopes. Ceratec is using that, that Technesium-99M I just mentioned to take pictures of the brain. And have the little images over here on the right-hand side, the top one, that has the GE logo, uh, logo on it, is a brain image of Technesium-99 uh, and looking for a blood flow in the brain. Again, that was developed with research and now is in clinical use and clinically available. What I meant is the Sumerian 153. I mentioned you know, quickly too about um, with, with bone cancer, um, and it's out there in the world. And Therosphere, it uses yttrium 90, and it's for treating liver cancer, another bad actor that typically is like a 5% survival rate. So it's very important drugs for uh, for cancer and for studying. And because we're cross disciplinary. This was our first patient with Quadrament um, because we can use the vet school to do clinical trials before we start putting in humans. Uh, this dog had a, a tumor on his forearm and uh, Quadrament was used and it, uh, treated and cured, cured that cancer and the dog went home healthy. Uh, this is the imaging process. This is called SPEC imaging. We won't get the details, but there's a patient laying on the table and those two big kind of blue things on, blue green things on each side are taking a picture where that radiation is inside the body. And you get pictures like this. Um, got something wrong inside of you? You'd like to figure out what's going on? You've got two choices. Turn yourself loose to a surgeon and they'll just start chopping you up until they find the problem. Or you can get a needle stick with a little radioactive material, let it biodistribute in the body and then take a picture of where it is and we can figure out what's going on. This is not good, you don't want to see it. Those bright spots are all tumors throughout the, throughout the body. And we can do the same thing if we had time for it. These are all elements that can be turned into radioactive equivalents for, in, for environmental work. These are ones that are used in industry. These are ones that are used in other places like space exploration and agriculture and whatever else. And when you get done, every place you see a colored bar there is a, is a radioactive isotope you can make out of that particular element for useful purposes. So that's the kind of stuff the research reactor does, okay? Now we'll switch gears and talk about the big ones. This is a picture of Callaway. That domed building sitting off center right is the containment building I was talking about earlier. That again has two to three foot thick concrete walls, um, inch stainless steel liner welded inside of it. It's a they pump it up to 60 pounds per square inch like your bicycle tire every few years to make sure it doesn't leak. It's a monstrous building and again it's a safety building to make sure that nothing gets out. And its purpose again in life is to make electricity. This very busy chart gives you an idea of why we want to talk about this. So what, you know, why run Callaway? Nobody likes nuclear power anyway. Somebody says they make electricity but so what? So what this does is it looks at energy usage in the U.S. This is actually only a year or so old. I just found it on the web yesterday. And what this is is all the energy resources on this side, the things that provide energy to us. And you see things like petroleum and coal and natural gas. And up there is solar and wind and nuclear and some other things. Then how that flows through the system. A, lot, a fair amount of it goes into making electricity. And that box up here, so we're saying here is that most of the coal that we're using in the U.S goes up this black line and goes into the coal power plants and electricity comes out of it. This side over here says where we use it, residential, commercial, industrial, and uh, transportation. And so you get a pretty quick picture of kind of how our energy flows through our systems and what we use it for. Let's try an example. So this petroleum one down here, oil, is a pretty good hunk of this whole thing, right? And it's flowing over here and it's going into transportation. What are we talking about? What is that? Gas. Yes, gasoline has in cars, right? Yeah. That's all that petroleum down there that gets turned into gas and goes to uh, cars. You see, that's a pretty good hunk of our total energy use. The 
point I want to make in bringing this all up is the fact that if you read this then and look at the bottom four, which includes natural gas, uh, coal, biomass, and petroleum, is almost 90% of the energy we use in the United States. Now, are there any concerns for burning coal and oil and natural gas? Anybody ever heard of global warming? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what we're talking about here, right? Okay. When you burn the fossil fuels, you're emitting CO2, which there's concern for the fact that may be increasing our CO2 uh, concentrations enough that we're causing global warming and you know, ice melting and you know, water levels rising and all that good stuff. And only about 10% plus on the top part, the nuclear, the hydro, the wind, or whatever else, are providing energy resources that do not emit those things. So bottom line is you're going to be concerned about CO2 or particulate or NOx oxides or whatever else is going out in the environment. You've got to get rid of 90% of what we're using for energy today. That's no mean task. So that's one of the reasons why nuclear might be important to us, along with the wind and the solar and everything else. Because we've got to get off the 90% stuff if we really think that global warming is an issue. It's a, it's a monstrous problem. Electricity, as you just saw in that previous chart, is running about 30%, 35%, 33%, something like that, of our total energy use is actually now going through that electrical energy box. And we know that, and we know that electricity continues to become a more important part of our society. Can anybody think of something that's coming on board that might be using more electricity than we're using today? Think about that transportation thing. Anything in transportation going on that might use electricity for too long? Electric cars, thank you. Electric cars, right? Great solution. You saw that big box and you missed the junk. Got our tailpipes at the bottom of that graph, all that petroleum going to transportation. We can do electricity instead. The question is, who's going to make the electricity? How are you going to do that? I, I'm getting too cynical on my old age. When they talk about electric cars, emission free, no emissions. Where did electricity come from? Oh, we burn a coal plant. Got to be careful. You need to be critical thinkers, right? So anyway, so another part of this picture is electricity is becoming more and more important. And it's probably going to grow. All the more reason to, to worry about making sure we have enough nuclear power plants, solar panels, whatever else to make that happen. Currently today, nuclear presents a, generates in the U.S. about 20% of our electricity. Now this is my kind of, I'm going to get too cynical, my other, my other way to look at this. So if you're worried about global warming, you're worried about fossil fuel usage, whatever else, it's going to take care of itself, and actually not too far in the future. It turns out that we have to be in the generation that's living in the world right now where we have about the peak use of fossil fuels. A hundred or so years ago, it was just getting started. And right now we're about to peak, and we know it's going to go down in the future because there's only so much of it in the ground. You're going to run that tank out someday. It's not being made nearly fast enough to replenish itself. It will run out. And people are speculating, if you do their research and stuff on this, that maybe another 100 years, and over that 100 years it's going to have to become less and less because there just isn't enough of it in the ground to get out. We just happen to be right at the peak, give or take 20, 30 years. Okay? So one way to look at this is, hey, the fossil fuel thing, the CO2 thing, the global warming thing is going to take care of itself because we're going to run out of fossil fuels. That's producing 90% of our energy today. That's a problem. Um, and again, we hope we don't mess up the world too badly or waiting for this stuff to run out. Uh, this just says another way, the sustainable energy resources, the nuclear, hydro, solar, whatever else, the percentage of those that are making electricity today are on the one side, the big parts of pie, gas, oil, and coal oil are the parts that are non-sustainable because we're going to run out of it. And anytime somebody draws a chart, well, how much more energy do we need in the world? And they can draw these charts where everything's getting bigger. I don't know. Do you think the U.S. is um, you using more electricity all the time, using more fuel all the time? Do you feel like you're, you, know, you're, you conserve, you try to cut back? It's good stuff. And I think we are still growing in energy use in the U.S., although it's not growing at a very high rate. But what that overlooks is the fact that two-thirds of the world is living in poverty. And if we want those folks to have any kind of a chance at a standard of living like ours in terms of our health and our longevity and food to eat and whatever else, they need energy. 
And so that's why these curves just all keep going up because it takes into account we know all over the world it's really impoverished it needs energy to, to get to a better quality of life. So here we got this 90% fossil fuel that we want to get rid of at the same time we need more and more and more to, to uh, provide energy for ourselves. So anyway, so let's look at how a nuclear power plant does this, little nuts and bolts. There's a nuclear reactor on the very right hand, left hand side where the uh, fuel is and it basically water, that yellow loop goes round, round, round and heats up the water going through that plant and then cools itself in the steam generator which is the second loop going round, 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 that's the, the blue uh, where the water comes in and hits the hot pipes from the reactor and turns that water into steam that steam goes over to a turbine which turns the generator and makes electricity and then there's a third loop over there uh, the bottom, sort of right, the darker blue, which is the cooling loop, which cools the power plant, kind of like the radiator on your car has to cool your car, it does the same thing. And that goes out to the cooling tower of the river, whatever else. So you can see in terms of radiation control, we have about three or four barriers between the reactor core and the outside world in terms of releasing stuff to the environment. Um, if, you were, if this was a coal-fired plant, you'd just take the nuclear reactor part, the orange and yellow stuff off, and just get rid of it, and you light a fire and use the steam generator and it'd be a coal fire plant because the rest of it's all the same basically. So let's build a plant. Fuel looks really different. This is a uh, fuel pellet. It's about as big around as your little finger, probably about as big as the first index on your finger. It's a uranium uh, dioxide ceramic material, kind of dinnerware sort of material. And uh, that is the uh, fuel pellet that actually when it fissions and uranium inside there does its thing and gives off energy. That old pellet runs about 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. That's where the heat comes from to make steam. Uh, those pellets get stacked on top of each other into a 12-foot-long rod. Again, about as big around as your little finger. And then those rods are bundled together in what's called a fuel assembly. There's a schematic on the left and then kind of an artist rendition there on the right. And that fuel assembly is 12 feet tall and has about 200 rods in it and enough space between the rods for water to flow up down through it and, and take away the energy. Uh, 200 of those fuel assemblies, we got 200 rods in a fuel assembly, now we take two of those fuel assemblies and put them together in the bottom of this tank, that solid red stuff down there at the bottom, and that's the core where the chain reaction occurs. And then water flows in and up through that core and picks up the heat, and then again that's taken to the steam generator and makes steam. That's the turbine part of it. Uh, turbine looks like it does in any electric generating plant. This could be a coal turbine, a natural gas turbine, or whatever else, a nuclear turbine, all pretty much the same. It's like the inside of a jet engine, the steam blows down through that and causes the fan blades to turn, if you will, and that turns the generator. And here's the cooling tower, which cools it all, kind of like the radiator on your car. That's actually, if anybody's seen it out on I 70, if you go up, yeah, if you go up to, uh, up through, Jeff City and get on uh, I-70 towards St. Louis, uh, just, just past the 54-70 interchange, maybe about 10 miles or so, you'll see the Calvary Cooling Tower off to your right to the south there. You see it from the interstate several places there. It's actually, it, it's, a big old, it's the biggest thing on the plant site you can see, and it's actually empty. <laughs> it's got a kind of a big a lawn sprinkler about a quarter of the way up that sprinkles out the hot water. It causes a natural draft of water to come up through it to cool the water, and that's what cools the plant. A little history. This shows the growth of nuclear energy in the U.S. It started back in the 60s with three nuclear power plants, small prototypes to prove that we could make electricity. That was President Eisenhower's Adams for Peace program, and that kind of got the commercial industry started. And then it slowly grew over the years, and we've been pretty much stable since the mid-90s now, about 100 units. Haven't built any more for quite a while. We do have four under construction right now on the, in the east, uh, Georgia and uh, North Carolina, South Carolina. Um, but pretty much kind of steady state, no, no real growth, no real loss at the present time in nuclear power. This shows how much energy we produce by nuclear power in the U.S. compared to other countries, and we do produce more. Worldwide, there are probably 450 of these plants, roughly. 
And we've got a hundred of them, so on a percentage basis of total energy, we produce more energy from nuclear than anybody else does. If you put that on a percentage basis and say how what fraction of your energy comes from nuclear power, in the US you've already seen it, it's 20%. There are other countries like France, they're like 80% nuclear. They produce over 80% of their energy from nuclear power because they don't have a lot of coal on the ground, they don't have a lot of oil on the ground, etc. They, they, they made a constant decision some time ago to get nuclear. They have the cheapest electrical rates in Europe and they sell their electricity to other European states from their nuclear power plants. They run about 55 plants or something. Uh, we've kind of covered this already, it's another way of saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. Of the 10% of our total energy when it does not emit, what, what is producing that? And what this shows us is that about 63% of that non-emission stuff that makes electricity is nuclear. Mm -hmm. And then hydroelectric's about 20%, and then all the rest of them, solar wind, et cetera, are some of the other part. Mm -hmm. We hear an awful lot about solar and wind and all that, and it's coming on and it's helping us. Um, but the fact of the matter is it's a small piece of a small piece at the present time. It's still got a long way to go to help us out. And that brings me to the capacity factors. A little bit on my nuclear soapbox. I got a promote the science, right? <laughs> um, this shows capacity factors. This is the fraction of time that a plant is available to produce energy. And this is important when we look at things like solar and wind. I do not want to knock those at all. It's not only these all above solutions, we need all the different energy resources we can get our hands on and solar and wind are part of those. I just want to make sure everybody understands when you say you're going to do that, that you realize the fact that it just isn't there all the time. Obviously, the sun sets at night. I like to watch TV in the evening, and if the sun sets and that's my source of power, and guess what, I'm going to watch TV, because I have electricity. We don't have batteries developed that can handle the large amounts of electricity storage we would need. That may come eventually. I'm kind of skeptical about that one. And just take battery sizes would just be incredible to do it. I have a friend in my neighborhood who put in a complete array of solar panels. On average, over the year, he's going to produce all of his energy. It's fantastic. But the sun still sets, and he still uses electricity. And where's that come from? <laughs> yeah, right. I'm printing on enough moonlight to push it worth. Yeah? Barn storage? Nope, sorry, I can't store it. Electricity is made and used here instantly. Huh? Yeah, but yeah, whose generator? It's not his. You're getting warm. It comes off the grid. You know, the coal plants and the nuclear plants and whatever else are out there provide his electricity night. Some's got to provide it. He's not providing it. Yeah, it could be a star. Yeah, could be a star. those stars. Anyway. So when you, when you install solar and wind, don't forget to also add enough backup so that when it's not there, you can still have electricity. Because we kind of like electricity 24-7. We get really upset. How many run out of electricity at home? Anybody have an outage? Nobody's had a whole few hours. Isn't it exciting? It's crazy, isn't it? You can't do anything. You can't do anything. It's just, it's just bizarre. We were out for about 24 hours here uh, last winter. Anyway. Capacity factor is important. One of the things that nuclear power does, they produce 24-7 and do it very reliably. And they do it for 18 months at a time before they have to be shut down to be refueled. Okay, so quick summary. This is what we've done. We've looked at research applications in nuclear science. We've looked at power applications in nuclear science. If I had another hour, we'd go through all the stuff at the bottom. These are all the fun, other fun things we do with nuclear and radiation science. Foodie radiation and, and air sterilization of instruments that go into uh, surgeries are done with radiation. Uh, you can prospect for oil, you can put space uh, batteries, uh, uh, radioactive uh, element powered batteries in space and go out to Jupiter and Saturn. All those wonderful pictures we're getting are happening because there are nuclear batteries on board those uh, spaceships. Um, on and on and on. All sorts of good stuff in addition to what we covered today. With that, how are we doing on time? We've got time for a few questions? Four minutes. Four minutes, four minutes. Okay, who's got a question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Not in the quantities we need. You'd be surprised how many batteries you take in your basement to just get you through the night. Yeah, we just don't have any way to store it. About the closest thing we have 
is what they call pump storage. What we do is we use a little excess electricity to pump water uphill. Then we let it come back down through a dam when we need it. That's about the only way we really know to, to store the kinds of quantities of electricity we need to like energy you and I. Yes, sir. Um, oh gosh, now that's an embarrassing question. As a nuclear engineer, I should because the nuclear industry said, "Yeah, we can we can solve this problem, whatever else." Um, something's going on out there. I, I will say this: we're at about 360 or so parts per million of CO2 in the environment, and it looks like the rate we're going might get to about 400. There were times in ancient, in, in the early times of the Earth, it was like 4,000. The Earth survived with 4,000 parts per million of CO2. Now, the Earth was completely different. That was back to the dinosaurs. And vegetation was growing everywhere, and uh, this is a whole different world. And I don't know if we could survive in that world, but we do know that the Earth has survived in very large concentrations of CO2 compared to what it is today. That's where I have to give a little pause, I guess, to put it that way. Good question. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. What's the cleanest way to get energy? Well, I would put those non those, those sustainable ones in there. I, I mean, I would include nuclear. Uh, people are worried about the radiation, but the fact of the matter, no one in the U.S. has ever been harmed from a nuclear power plant. Zero. Absolutely zero. You can't say that about any other industry. And then uh, solar and wind obviously have the potential to do that. Uh, solar cells do require some kind of noxious chemicals to make them, but we can control that. It's not a big deal. Who knows? And the hydroelectric, I don't call them hydroelectric, you've got to cover up the, somebody's ground when you want to put it in another, in another uh, lake or dam. Yeah.